Hello and welcome to another episode of the Our Foundations podcast. My name is Joshua, your host, and today's episode will be a follow-up to the Pete Quinones interview that I just did. We played that for the previous two episodes. I broke that up into two. And now I want to talk about some related subjects before we move on to the next chapter of this season, season three. So one of the biggest issues that I have as far as a difference between my view and Pete's view And as a short recap, if you are coming in blind here, uh, Pete Quinones is big on taking a more Machiavellian local politics approach to seeking out more freedom and more liberty in our society. He used to be very focused on libertarianism and agorism, and now he seems to be shifting more into this local politics approach as being something that is very effective for pushing change. And so we debate Debated that perspective versus like a community agorism perspective. Now, I did not get into ideology and morality with him very much, but that actually is my personal main difference of opinion with him. So I was arguing and in that interview for more of a practical perspective of why I believe agorism, uh, community-centric agorism, is a better strategy for most people going forward. Uh, There is more to it, though. And so for this episode, I want to say a little bit about that, about the morality, the ideology, kind of that perspective, and then get into some other examples of strategies that correlate to and are in line with these same principles, the same ideology, the same morality. So other examples of things similar to agorism. And that's what I want to present in today's episode. So to begin with, I would like to say that in my opinion, and I think most of my listeners would agree with this, the state as a whole is an immoral entity. It's an immoral system. It's very foundation. The very structure of how it operates is based on immoral principles, especially looking at the things that I've covered here in season three. If you go back to the natural order episodes and that framework, the state is just against virtually every aspect of the light side of the natural order. So that is a problem. I would also count big corporations, kind of the mega corporate world, big pharma, big tech, big ag, uh, the military industrial complex, these different groups of corporations, that side of the corporate world, I would put on par with the governmental systems, the state systems that are currently in power, or at least share that power in today's world. So with these entities, with this hierarchical structure that is currently in existence, with that being immoral, with it not functioning according to the natural order of things, at least the light side, then what is the solution moving forward? And what I would propose is that the solution cannot be something that also opposes the light side of the natural order, something that is also immoral. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If the whole reason why I don't want to be a part of that system is because it's immoral and it doesn't match with the natural order, then I would basically be completely hypocritical if I choose a strategy that is also immoral and against the natural order of things. So you could make the light versus heavy argument. That's an old, uh, going back to the old Jewish argument for the Hebrews, they had this principle of light versus heavy, where we live in a world where bad things happen, where there is evil, there is sin. And sometimes you're just stuck with this situation where you have to do something that is not in line with the natural order, with Mosaic law, with uh, God's principles. And so what they would do in a situation like that is figure out which action would be lighter and which action would be heavier. So which action would be less of an evil, less against God's principles, and then which action would be more against that? Which one would be worse? Which one would be closer to pure evil? And they would do the lighter of the two. Now, that is an argument you could make. You could say that using politics to achieve more freedom, yes, you're using an immoral means. You're using force and coercion to some extent, but you're not doing it 
to the extent that, say, a revolution would or revolt would or some of these other methods of getting attaining that power. And so you could make that argument. The reason why I would say that argument is invalid, however, is that you're not stuck in a situation where you have to do one or the other. There are other options. And that would lead us to today's episode, at least the main topic for today's episode is what are those other options? So there are other options that do fit within the natural order of things from a moral perspective, an ideological perspective. And that is what I want to focus on. So First, I would say agorism. That's something that I've talked about a lot on this show, so you should be very familiar with it. But if not, you can uh, search for older episodes that talk about agorism and familiarize yourself even more. But with agorism, the whole point is that you are operating in the counter-economy. It comes from the Greek word agora, which would be the marketplace where not only people would exchange goods, sometimes services, but also share ideas, also catch up with one another and get the local news and all kinds of things like this. It was sharing information. It was sharing goods. It was sharing services. It was where people congregated together and through voluntary interaction, exchanged things. Things were happening. People were meeting. Relationships were being built and grown. People were learning. All of these types of things were happening. This is the agora. And so the idea is that agorism would be recreating this concept built totally on voluntarism and totally outside of the immoral activities and laws and regulations of the state, as well as the immoral aspects of what's called the red market. So anything related to violence or force. The main way that markets are divided from an agorist perspective would be that you have the white market, the gray market, the black market, the red market, and the pink market. So let's just start off with the black market. The black market would be any illegal activity that is not involved with force or coercion. So this would be uh, choosing to use drugs that are illegal on your own time, but not harming anybody else. Maybe going too fast down the highway and breaking the speed limit law, but not harming anyone else or any number of things, maybe selling some food, but you didn't officially get FDA approval and get them to inspect your facility or selling goods, but you're not reporting the profits to the IRS. These are illegal activities, and most of that would be considered black market activity. But shifting into maybe getting paid for something and not necessarily mentioning that on your tax records, that's shifting into more of the gray market. The gray market is this idea of dealing with goods or services that aren't necessarily illegal themselves, but that there is state regulation, state laws, these types of things that govern that good or service. So although eggs, for example, chicken eggs, chicken eggs are not illegal to buy or to sell or to eat or anything else. But if I am getting chicken eggs from my chickens and then selling them directly to individuals for a profit, technically, I am supposed to get approval for that. I'm supposed to claim that on taxes. There's a lot of regulation involved, even with such a simple thing. And so If I am not doing any of that, then I would be operating in the gray market. I'm dealing with legal goods and services, but not necessarily according to the laws and regulations that are set in place for those goods and services. Now, if I were to operate in the realm of legal things, this would be the white market. So the white market would be anything state approved. And that would be state approved on all levels. I'm following the laws, following the regulations, not going against anything the state says that I'm not supposed to do. And that would be the white market. Now, if you shift into legal activities that are violent, legal activities that use force or coercion, that would be the pink market. So we're shifting into the red market would be pure violence, but there is some state approved violence. So things like war, some policing activities such as no knock warrants or locking someone up in a cage for a victimless crime, things of that nature. And anything else such as maybe even taxation could be argued as being 
pink market because you're basically extorting someone at the point of a gun where if you don't pay your taxes to the state, the state will come and forcibly, physically take you and lock you in a cage for tax evasion. There is a few steps in between the one and the other, but you know that would kind of be borderline using force and coercion and violence in order to achieve a goal of the state in a way that is state approved, that is perfectly legal. So that would be the pink market. And then the red market would be violent activity, force and coercion that is not state approved. So this would be things like organized crime, cartels, assassinations, theft, things of this nature. Now, again, some theft is state approved and some is not. So some is pink market, some is red market. But the whole point of agorism is that agorism operates in the gray and black markets. Agorism is not white market activity, and it is not red market activity, and it is not anywhere in between in the pink market activity. Agorism has nothing to do with these things. If you are operating in these realms, you are not participating in agorism. You're just not. That's not what agorism is. Agorism is operating, like I said earlier, in the counter economy. So you have the mainstream economy. That would be the white market, the pink market. You have the red market economy. That would be organized crime, cartels, syndicates, that nature. And then you do have this counter economy, which would be the black market and the gray market. And that is the realm for agorism. So this would be things like under-the-table transactions or operating without a license or civil disobedience. Anything of this nature would be considered agorism. It is operating outside of the system. But again, there is no red market. There is no white market activity, no pink market activity. There is no violence or force of the state. There is no state blessing on what you are doing as well. If the state is saying, yes, you go ahead and do that, that is perfectly fine, and you are doing it 100% the way we say you should, that's not necessarily agorism. That is not the gray market or the black market. That's the white market. So there is a bit of a difference here that I would have personally to Konkin, who is the one that coined the term agorism. And I would say that there is some activity that can be legal that also fits every other definition of agorism. And that would be the best example I have would be homeschooling. I talked about this with Pete as well. That was an example that seemed to fit very well. We used a lot. But with homeschooling, at least where I live, and this is different in other places, there are countries where homeschooling is completely illegal. And if you homeschooled your kids, that would be according to the letter of the law definition of agorism, that would be agorism. But where I live, it is legal to homeschool. Basically, all you have to do is tell the state, hey, I'm homeschooling my kids. Thank you. And that's it. You don't really have to do anything else. And so in that case, me homeschooling my kids is not agorism by definition, at least according to a strict definition. But it does mean that I'm pulling my kids out of the public education system I am not participating in the state-sanctioned activities of education, at least not according to their version of it and not according to their system of education, and I am operating outside of that system. I am, in a sense, operating in the counter-economy, a system counter to the state system, but it is legal. So that would be kind of a difference that I would have an opinion personally that there is some activity that maybe doesn't hit the letter of the law for agorism, but I still generally consider agorist activity because it fits every other aspect of the definition. It's operating outside of the system. It's operating in a counter economy. It is withdrawing support and consent from the state and so on and so forth. So with the idea of agorism, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to withdraw your reliance on the state, trying to withdraw your support from the state. You're trying to withdraw your consent from the state. You're withdrawing all of this. You're withdrawing yourself 
from the state. And instead of operating in that economy, the mainstream economy, the state-sanctioned economy, you are operating in the counter-economy according to agorist principles. One of the reasons that Konkin gave for this was that, like I mentioned, the state's immoral, and you don't want to support that. But not only that, you do want to go against that. And so his strategy for going against the state is not to approach it head on, but to withdraw funds, withdraw support, withdraw consent. And in doing so, you are withdrawing power and influence from the state. You are dwindling the state down through this counter-economic activity. And so that was one of his goals in creating and promoting agorism. The second strategy that I want to talk about is the first realm versus second realm perspective. So the idea here is kind of similar. And again, all of these are similar because they are trying to achieve the same goal through roughly the same moral stance. Now, with the first realm, second realm perspective, the first realm would be the realm that doesn't respect self-ownership and liberty. It's a collective realm over an individualistic realm. It's a realm of government and authority being the supreme hierarchy that we live under. It's a realm that's taxed and regulated. There are immoral markets and immoral activity and violence and force and coercion. That is the mainstream economy, so to say, from the Agoras perspective. That's the first realm. That's the world that we generally live in, the systems we live under. That is the realm of the state and the corporate oligarchies. That is the first realm. Now, the second realm is basically just anything that's not involved with the first realm. So the second realm would be all of this counter-economic activity, so to say. It's everything that is outside of the first realm. With this realm being mostly illegal activity, there is an aspect of security culture and privacy that is heavily emphasized within the second realm. One example of this would be using false names and false identities, going by a pseudonym of some nature, and in doing so, you're basically creating creating a new identity for the you that operates in the second realm. The you that operates in the second realm is different than the you that operates in the first realm. So those are two different entities, even though it's still you. And then in addition to this, you don't want the risk of the state finding out who you are in the first realm, because there can be legal repercussions that you might not want to suffer. And so you might want to try to remain anonymous, try to um, at least increase your privacy and decrease your risk. And so that is something that is heavily emphasized. Another aspect of this is something that has existed for a long time historically, like a lot of these things have. And that would be this aspect of being able to reinvent yourself, being able to get a fresh start, that sort of thing. So if you are in the second realm and you make a bad choice of some kind, you do have the ability to totally change your identity, totally change your name, and then rebuild a reputation for yourself and rebuild a new identity in the second realm. Obviously, there can be some negatives with this, with people that want to scam others and take advantage of others, these types of things. But for the most part, most people... Uh, just want a fresh start because they want a fresh start because they've made mistakes and they want to do things over again. You can't do that really in the first realm. At least it's very difficult to do so. Now, in earlier historical times, this was something that could be done a lot easier. You could move to a different town, maybe a few thousand miles away, and go by a different name, and you would basically create a new reputation, a new identity, all of these kinds of things and it would be much harder for your reputation and your background and history to follow you to that new town. That is not something that we really have today. So that is an aspect that is highlighted in the second realm. Now, for an example of what the second realm is, 
I would recommend, uh, kind of recommend, a book called Hashtag Agora. And that is one that's specifically about agorism and the second realm. And it's a little novella that talks about these things and the characters are operating in that world. I would say that if you are sensitive to things like language and some sexual references and things of this nature, then do not pick up that book. And it is not necessarily extremely high quality literature, but it is still good. It is still entertaining. And it is something that lays out these Uh, principles and examples pretty well in a fictional story setting. And so that is something you could look at. But I have talked a lot in the past on this podcast about anarcho-capitalism. And so the idea of an anarcho-capitalist market, where it's a totally free market, that is the second realm. That is the world of something like, say, cryptocurrency, at least unregulated cryptocurrency outside of centralized exchanges, the way cryptocurrency was meant to be, so to say. And so that would be part of the second realm. Now, cryptocurrencies in general, blockchain technology, at least the privacy-centric ones, are a good example of second realm activity, where you can participate in a monetary system that is totally outside of the first realm. And you can uh, combine that with a lot of other activities that you may or may not be doing. And that would also be part of the second realm. If you have heard about crypto anarchy or crypto anarchists, that is more the vein that they are seeking and following. Another example would be something like a temporary autonomous zone, a TAS. And that would be basically a physical place that you can go that does not have any jurisdiction or ability to enforce the laws and regulations of the state. So this could be something permanent, but more than likely, it is something that is not, that is mobile, that is temporary, why you call it a temporary autonomous zone. So this could be something like a mobile uh, camper. This could be a shipping container. This could be where something where you're operating in different spaces. You're renting some office space for a week and then somewhere else for a day and at this nightclub for a day, whatever. But when you are in control of this temporary autonomous zone, you are doing just that. You are creating a physical autonomous zone, totally autonomous from the state. And within that zone, basically anything goes, at least according to free market principles and second realm principles. And so that would be a physical representation of the second realm in a similar way that privacy-centric decentralized cryptocurrencies could be a digital version of the second realm. Another aspect that is incorporated in the second realm perspective would be that of proxy merchants. So you do have people that participate in the second realm. And then ideally, at least from this perspective, some people operate only in the second realm. Then you have your first realmers, the people who only operate in the first realm. And then you do have some crossover. The main and most important crossover identity would be that of a proxy merchant. And this would be someone that brings goods or services from the first realm to the second realm and vice versa, brings goods and services from the second realm to the first realm. So for example, with cryptocurrency, let's say that you wanted to get a hold of some Bitcoin, but you didn't want your name associated with it. You didn't want the first realm to have anything to do with you holding Bitcoin. And actually, let's change that to Monero. That might fit our situation a little better here, a privacy coin. So you want Monero, but you don't want any record of that. So you're not going to go through Coinbase or Gemini or any of these centralized exchanges. Instead, you may go through a proxy merchant. So you might know somebody or have somebody that knows somebody, you know, a friend of a friend kind of a thing. And they are operating in this proxy merchant role where they have attained Monero or stable coins or Bitcoin or some kind of cryptocurrency that you can easily make into Monero or it is Monero itself. They have attained this through other means, whatever means that may be. And for this example, let's say they attained it through a centralized exchange. So there is a record of them attaining this currency, this cryptocurrency. And then you would give them cash in exchange for some of this cryptocurrency. And in doing so, you are 
creating a transaction that has no trace, that has no ties to the first realm. So you're severing that connection from the first realm and bringing those goods, so to say, that cryptocurrency into the second realm where you are going to use it for second realm activity and do whatever you want to do with it. And so that person that takes the cryptocurrency from the first realm to the second realm, that would be the proxy merchant and vice versa. Let's say Monero goes up 10 times its price over the course of a few weeks. You know, very unlikely, but actually possible in the world of cryptocurrencies. And so you want to cash out some of this. But again, you operate in the second realm. You do not want to operate in the first realm. So you would probably go to a proxy merchant and give them your Monero. In exchange, they give you cash. Now, that cash came from the first realm, but they are being this proxy merchant, bringing that cash into the second realm, where then you will use it again for second realm activities. So that is one example of a player within this first realm, second realm perspective. The third strategy to mention would be VANU, and VANU is V-O-N-U, and that somehow stands for Voluntary Not Vulnerable, and that is the goal of VANU. It is becoming resilient to the coercion of the state mainly through lifestyle choice and lifestyle change. So the idea is, again, just like all of these other examples, the state's immoral, you don't want to have anything to do with that system, or at least as little as possible. And in order to do so, in order to live a life that in some way is apart from that system, you do have to have some resilience to that system and resilience to the coercion of that system and the intrusion of that system into your life. And so in order to build up this resilience, you are going to make some changes within your lifestyle, within how you live and the community you surround yourself with. So Vanu does have a lot to do with family and community that's kind of the general focus where you have others that are with you. And again, even if that's just immediate family, you have other people and therefore you can count on each other. And you also are increasing self-sufficiency. So again, you're building up resilience from the coercion of the state and of the, let's say, the first realm system. And so when you are building up that resilience, you kind of need to have a level of self-sufficiency. And this could be within your family or within a small community of some kind. It can be for yourself, but um, like has been addressed many different times, like with Vin Armani and myself and many others, if you're just focused on self-sufficiency, that is usually doomed to fail. You need other people. Not only do you need other people, but if you're trying to go according to the natural order of things, there is this aspect of love being one of the main underlying principles of the natural order. And love involves you and others. It's not just you. And there are many other examples that you could pull from the natural order of things that would signify the fact that you have to have other people. You have to have relationships. You have to have community of some kind in order to be a part of this natural order framework on the light side. So a lot of people that talk about Vanu, they like to do things similar to a temporary autonomous zone. They like to be mobile. They like to be able to move around. So a lot of them will live a minimalist lifestyle, maybe live out of a camper or out of a van, maybe live in a way where they're camping out at different places. They are mobile, very mobile, or maybe they are building temporary shelters or tiny homes or things like this, and then they're relocating around or they have a community that is somehow private to some extent, probably off the grid and off the beaten path. And these are the types of strategies that they would use. A lot of uh, creating your own energy, creating your own food, having relationships with other like-minded people that you can then source from, a uh, proxy merchant role, so to say. And that would be some of what the Vanu perspective would use in order to achieve this goal of becoming more resilient to the coercion of the state. That then brings us to the next next example, and that would be mutual aid and mutual assistance groups. 
And this is something that has been going on for quite a while. It is, again, like the rest of these, nothing new, but it's another strategy to basically increase your resilience to the coercion of the state, to not operate within this immoral system. You know, all these same goals that all of these strategies have. So if you have a mutual aid system set up, or you have a mutual aid group that you're a part of, then you have this community of people that you can rely on. This is a community where you can help one another. It's mutual aid. So if someone is in need, then they can call on you and on the group, and they will get help to do whatever they need to do. Let's say they have a tree fall and they need it cut up and gotten out of the driveway so they can exit their property, that might be an important thing. And maybe they don't really have the money, or maybe a lot of other tree services are completely swamped because a tornado just came through or who knows what. But for whatever reason, you want the assistance of others directly, and you can get that if you have a group like this set up. What if someone loses their job and doesn't have an income, but they do have a family, they do have bills, and they need to somehow continue on? Well, if If you have a group that is already set up to help financially support anyone that is in need, then that is very helpful. Maybe someone is out of commission. For example, there was a baby that was born and the mom, the dad, the family, they're pretty swamped. They're worn out. There's a lot going on. And maybe the mutual assistance group steps up and brings some meals to that family. And then that family doesn't have to worry about Uh, making meals, taking the time, putting forth the mental effort, and they can focus that on the new baby and their situation and whatnot. So that would be the idea of a mutual aid or mutual assistance group. Now, uh, some examples of this would be something like a secret society. There are some secret societies that were founded on very similar principles. Now, a lot of times there's a lot of other baggage attached, but that is an aspect of many secret societies that are in existence today and have been in existence throughout history. Another example might be churches. So most churches do participate in this type of activity. For example, when my wife has had a baby, this has happened a few times now, and each time our church steps up and people bring meals for, I think it's like a two-week period or something, we get roughly three meals a week, and our church just has this automatic system set up for that where people pitch in, people voluntarily choose to help out and give mutual aid to the other members in their congregation. And this is something that does exist. Churches do, at least should, and many do participate in this type of activity. Another example that would be very different would be something like a militia. So you do have groups sometimes that are focused on mutual defense. So if the grid goes down and things go crazy and we're in post-apocalyptic world, then this group of people has a rallying point and they come together and they help defend each other and that type of thing. I'm honestly not really sure exactly what the realistic plans are for militias of that nature, but uh, there is this aspect of mutual aid in terms of defense, in terms of self-defense for anyone that is a part of the group. And oftentimes they do train together, they do study tactics, they do make sure that they have the skills and the resources to be able to defend themselves and protect their members. And that is just another example. Not one that fits in very well with the idea of not being a part of the red market or dealing with violence or court or force, but it is an example of a mutual aid group to an extent, and that is why I would mention it here. So the next example of a strategy moving forward is one that comes from history. It's one that I've really enjoyed learning about over, I guess, the past year or more. But this would be the idea of the parallel polis. This idea would stem from Charter 77, which was something that came out of the Soviet Union era under communism. And it was a group of people that created, uh, the way that they described it, at least, was a loose, informal, and open association of people united by the will to strive individually and collectively for respect for human and civil rights. 
that would be their idea that they would have presented as what they are and who they are. Now, part of the reason for this is that it was illegal to have organized opposition to the state and to the ruling political party. So if you're a loose, informal, open association of people, then that's not organized resistance to the political party in rule. And so therefore, it's a legal way to conduct your business, so to say. And so there was this uh, charter written up, Charter 77, and a lot of people and even a lot of influential people of the time signed up to it. And it did start a lot of this resistance movement, or at least expanded it a lot more under the communist rule of the time. Now, the specific idea for the parallel polis came from Vaclav Binda, who essentially wanted to build an independent society, an independent polis that was not oppressed by the laws and decisions of representatives of public authorities. So the idea is that instead of having other people make decisions and laws and regulations and govern my life, I want a society that is independent of this. I want a parallel society that is independent. I want a parallel polis. That is the idea. So this parallel polis is based on its own values, and it is not forced on the parallel polis by any central authority. And that is what the parallel polis is. Now, as far as some concrete examples... Uh, Binda did talk about the pillars of the parallel polis, and he had a list, and I made a few notes about this list, so I'll go ahead and read them. And they are ones that you could easily apply to modern times and to all of these different strategies going forward. But this is what he believed was most important about building out this parallel polis. One of its main functions was to be constantly monitoring rights and freedoms, as well as be willing to act in their defense. So basically, the parallel polis is some sort of balanced power to the power of the state, and you will not have the state taking away freedoms and liberties unnoticed, because the parallel polis is watching. And not only are they watching, they are willing to act. Now, I'm not exactly sure what that action looks like, but we will leave that alone, and that's not worth digging into. But the next pillar would be to build out an alternative culture and alternative art. So the idea here was that the communist system in charge at the time was very sensitive to the material and the content that people put forward. There were a lot of times when censorship came into play, and they would say that certain songs or bands or certain books or certain pieces of art were just not allowed because they didn't go along with the mainstream narrative of the ruling authorities. And so they would censor that. Well, one of the pillars of the parallel polis is to have an alternative culture an alternative art scene where you can present ideas, you can present content, you can be creative in ways that may not be right in line with the mainstream authorities, might even go against the mainstream authorities. That is needed. You need to have that ability to speak freely and to share information. Now, the next pillar would be the importance of parallel education and science. And the way that this would be carried out would be through things like residential seminars, educational societies, academies, things of this nature. Now, some of them did participate in basically in homeschooling, and that was a very important aspect. They did believe that science was another field that was important to have an alternative source of information on because state-sanctioned science often comes to state-sanctioned conclusions. And that is not, by definition, real science, at least according to the scientific method. Now, there might be some common parallels to today's society there. The next pillar is a parallel information system. And this would be a system that could be used for free dissemination of information. So anything from a newspaper to a magazine to articles to speeches to whatever, there needed to be a way of dissemination information that did not get censored, that could not be stopped, that could not be traced back to the source. They needed some parallel. They 
could not operate strictly on the information they received from state-sanctioned sources. They had to have a parallel information system for these types of things. And I guess the reason should be pretty obvious there. The next pillar would be a parallel economy. And this would be an economy that was based on reciprocity and trust. This would be an economy where resources were not dependent on control of monetary tools. And that is something that was very prevalent in a communist system where the state did control the monetary system. They had all the monetary tools. They controlled where resources went, where money went, how things were allocated. They were in complete control. That's kind of the whole idea there. And uh, what Binda believed is that part of this parallel polis would have to be this parallel economy that was based on individual relationships and the movement of resources that was outside of these controls. Now, the next pillar is parallel political structures. Now, obviously, this would be contrary to an agorist perspective. In agorism, you don't use politics. Well, Benda did believe that there was a role for politics, and his main reasoning does make a lot of sense. His idea was what would replace the current authoritarian regime. So if the regime does fall, if we are successful, or if we just get lucky, what replaces it? What happens next? Is it just a new authoritarian regime? Is it a new dictator of some kind? Well, that's not what they wanted. They wanted a parallel political structure set up so that if and when the state falls, they have something else to fall back on. Now, as a random, uh, I guess not too random, but as a relevant side note here, there is another Vaclav, Vaclav Havel, who was also a member of Charter 77 and later became the president of Czechoslovakia when they broke away from the rule of the communist regime. And so, you know, there were people that did put these things into place. They they did put them into effect. They did use them effectively, according to how Benda describes here. So that was something that he believed was pretty important. The final pillar of the parallel polis would be parallel foreign policy. And this would be in order to acquire financial and mental resources. And they believed that their own economy, their own uh, polis, needed outside resources. It needed not only physical resources, but also financing. It needed ideas, the mental resources, creativity, all kinds of things. They couldn't just do it all themselves, nor did they want to. They needed to have a parallel foreign policy. So you had a foreign policy that the communist regime had, but the parallel polis would have a totally different foreign policy, and that should be set up so that you do have allies, you do have other resources and relationships. And that was the final pillar that Binda believed was in need for this parallel polis. Now, you should, again, see a lot of parallels between the parallel polis and all these other strategies. So that would then bring us to the final strategy, and that would be the one that I've been talking a lot about for season three of the Our Foundations podcast, and that would be the original Christian church. Now, the The Christian church of the time, let's say just after Christ, that first generation or so, they were opposed to the religious system of that day. Not only that, they were opposed to the political system of that day. Not only that, they were opposed to the mainstream culture of their day. They were basically opposed to all of the systems that were in place and had influence in their society. And so what did they do? They created a parallel society, and that was the idea of the church. They did believe, like Agorists, that it was not moral to rebel or to start a revolt, they didn't believe it was moral to participate in the red market in any way, or even the pink market. There was no use of political means to achieve the ends that the church sought, at least not in that first generation. Now, there was later a blending of church and state over and over again throughout history, and that is a totally different subject. The historical example I'm talking about is the original church, the very first set of churches that occurred let's say within 100 years or less 
of the time that Christ was teaching himself, that Yeshua was teaching people directly. So instead of revolting or rebelling, they used direct action and systems that were outside of these systems currently in place. So they dealt with things directly on their own. They took action. They had a welfare system where they helped the poor, not only their own poor, but the poor of Rome in general that were outside of the church. Uh, Roman officials complained quite often about the church in this regard because they would say they don't only take care of their own needy, they take care of ours as well. And so they're talking about how they're getting a lot of public support and, you know, it's kind of hard to deal with these people. They're being nice and helping people and, you know, how can we oppose them? How can we do this without drawing, you know, negative attention from the rest of the public and the community? And so that is a strategy in and of itself, but that was from a moral perspective, at least as far as the church was concerned. They handled disputes and legal matters within their own parallel system. So if there was a dispute within the church, that was handled within the church. They didn't go to Rome for that. Yeshua actually specifically talked about that on the Sermon on the Mount, where if you have a dispute with a brother, with another person, then while you're on your way to court, you should probably stop and settle your dispute before you get to court. Because if you get involved with the state system, with that official court, there's no telling what's going to happen. You have a judge, you have an officer, you have uh, mandated policies, you have something that is going to uh, be decided. You have this verdict that's going to be decided, and it's going to be official. And even if it's horrible for you, that's what you're going to be stuck with. It's much better to settle your disputes outside of the... Uh, court system that is in place by the centralized authorities, by Rome, so to say. And so they did handle a lot of things outside of the legal system of Rome. They ideally handled everything outside of that system. And they also did at times consider that it was better to be wronged and better to let an injustice slide than to go into the legal system of Rome and try to fight a legal battle. And there are many reasons for this, everything from being a bad example to promoting, you do like a natural order perspective of promoting chaos that's you know not ideal in any way. And so anytime where you have a dispute and you have arguments and you have two people fighting against each other, you know, obviously that's not in line with the natural order. And so they believe that it was better to be wronged, suffer an injustice, and do so publicly than to uh, bring a legal dispute to the secular court system. Now, I did mention charity was another example where the early church did have a welfare system in place for its own members, but also in place for the community as a whole, that at least the community that was in need. They built a tight community of people in general, so they had this aspect of being a mutual aid group, a mutual assistance group, and everything that I talked about related to that as well. And they also did refuse any political means. A lot of the early church fathers talked about how a Christian cannot be a magistrate and that a Christian may not seek that office. And if a Christian is already in that office, they will leave that office. And it depends on the person you read as to how strong that was. And I'm actually going to get there. There'll be a later episode on specifically what some of the people within the early church said themselves. And I'll get to some of those quotes, and those can be very interesting. But that would be the final example of what I wanted to bring up for strategies of achieving more freedom and liberty, building resilience from the coercion of the state, all of these types of things that do not involve becoming part of the evil, immoral, political system that is in charge. And so there are many different ways of approaching that that still are in line with this idea of, uh, say, following the framework of the natural order, the light side of the natural order, or the moral principles of, let's say, biblical principles, or this ideology of voluntarism. All of these things are essentially ethical structures that we believe, me and I think, think, every listener of this podcast, we believe that these are very important, that this is morality. And I believe, I hope that we all want to live and act in a moral way ourselves. And
And we would prefer to live and act in a moral society, a moral system as well. And so in order to do that, these are many different strategies that are similar in ways, but that do offer a few different examples of how to seek those goals without shifting into the dark side, shifting into the immoral activities of the state and using force and coercion and these types of things. So that does conclude this episode. The next episode will be specifically on a Christian perspective. And so this, since season three is all about using the historical early church, the original church, as an example of basically early agorism, the idea is that, well, if you are living according to those principles, let's say biblical principles, the teachings of Yeshua, then how are you to act? Because agorism isn't necessarily that. The second realm isn't that. Vanu isn't that. The parallel polis isn't that. Mutual aid groups, they are not that. The early church, yeah, pretty much is that. And so I'm going to talk about that aspect of bringing that perspective into the modern world and how would you apply that? What does that mean if those are the principles that you are following? And so again, getting into the perspective of the early church and then applying it to modern times. I do need to say thank you to Elbert, who is the newest supporter of the show. He subscribed on Subscribestar, and that is one of the two platforms that I have set up, Subscribestar and Patreon. So if you do want to support the content of this show and me producing it, then please do sign up. I greatly appreciate that. Thank you, Elbert. That is very nice of you. And if you would like to claim your perk, as well as anybody else that has not done so already, that is a supporter, you may request a question or a topic or something of that nature, and I will address it at some point on the podcast directly. And so that's perk you get with being a patron, being a supporter. Now, there are some other random perks. I am releasing little snippets of a book that I'm writing, kind of not necessarily chapter at a time, but a few pages at a time at least. So if you're interested in this type of thing, uh, a lot of basically what I'm talking about in season three is what I'm writing about in the book. And so if you're interested in that kind of stuff, then you will slowly get that book released through Patreon and Subscribestar, so whichever one. And if you want to support through other means, let's say cryptocurrency would be the most ideal, and you want to just do that directly, then please feel free to do so. But you do have to tell me that you are supporting the show through those means, and that way I can get whatever perks you want. So if you want to be reading along with what I am releasing, I'll send that to you. Just give me an email address. It can be a fake one. You know, you can participate in security culture and keep your name anonymous and whatnot, but still receive some of those perks. So if you want to, you may participate in that. I also do want to give a call for anyone who has not left a rating or review on this podcast as a whole. Please do so. That is very important. And then also want to give a bit of a random shout out to earlier episodes. So it's something that kind of has been on my mind the past few weeks where I've had some people interested in blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies, as well as some other aspects of like, you know, how does the economy really function? How does the world really work behind the scenes? What about these conspiracies that are going on and, you know, all this stuff. And I I've been addressing this for a few years now, and I have a lot of content on that in previous episodes. So uh, for example, if you go back to the series I did on blockchain and cryptocurrencies, that was episode 41, I believe is the first episode of that series. At the end of that series, I covered two specific projects, and that was Pivx and Cardano. And if, by chance, you decided to put some money into Pivx or Cardano at that point in time, uh, you would be very happy, to say the least, in you know our current situation where markets are concerned. And so that is not financial advice by any means. I definitely am not saying that. But what I am saying is that there's a lot of stuff if you have not gone back and listened to the podcast as a whole. I have this whole podcast set up to be chronological and things build on each other. And if you learn from those things that are building on each other, there are many ways where you can benefit from that in many different forms. So I will say that aspect at least. And I will also say that if you go back to the prediction episode that I did, I think that was episode 100. 
think that was kind of a special episode. And uh, the following I didn't update because that was right before Biden got elected. And part of my prediction was that Trump would get elected. And so I had to clarify that a little bit. And basically, most everything I said still did hold. Um, Basically, what I did is I just pushed forward the timeline of events. And if you go back and listen to that, some of the stuff may seem obvious, uh, but at the time of recording, it was not. So, for example, uh, one of the things that I said would be the main story for this year, for 2021, was cyber attacks and cyber warfare. And guess what? We've had you know a pipeline attacked. We've had you know, all kinds of different cyber attacks that have gone into place. You had solar winds. You have all kinds of stuff. And that has been a major news story throughout the year. And so if you go back and listen to that now, you're like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, before this year, that was wasn't such a big deal. And you're just starting to get some ransomware attacks that you'd hear about every now and then. But, you know, this major, large scale cyber aspect was not a mainstream narrative, as well as the whole dark winter scenario. I was not saying that all of society would fall apart. What I was saying is that you would have more draconian policies where you'd have mandates and things like this related to COVID. And that would happen as flu season picked up. And guess what? That actually did happen. Now, looking back, it doesn't seem as extreme because we're kind of used to it. We've kind of become accustomed to people wearing masks out in public and people keeping their distance and people always being being worried about, oh, that person coughed or that person sneezed. Oh, I wonder if they have, you know, the dreaded invisible enemy and that kind of thing. Like that wasn't normal. That wasn't normal at all when I was doing those episodes. So just keep that in mind if you go through those episodes as well. But again, there's a lot of content that would be you know, not only interesting, but also helpful and beneficial. And this is also a reminder that the podcast is designed for you to start at episode one and go all the way through. And I would, I would highly, highly, highly recommend that. There are many reasons for that. So this is a shout out for that. If you are not able to do so, but you are interested in certain aspects, certain content, certain themes or topics, feel free to email me and I can send you a list of episodes to listen to in order so that you can get whatever you're going for. Just tell me roughly how much time you have, you know, how many episodes can you consume realistically and what are you trying to get out of it? And I will point you in the right direction with specific episode numbers if that's helpful. Also, feel free to reach out to me for any reason, any questions, any arguments, any suggestions, anything whatsoever. That would be at our foundations at protonmail.com. There are links in the show notes for all this stuff. Cryptocurrency addresses, a website where you can listen to the show. Um, I guess the email address is on there. The Twitter handle at Foundations PC, all kinds of stuff. So look in the show notes for all that. And that's it. So I will be back next week. Please come back. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for all your support. I'm out. Peace. This has been our Foundations Podcast. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. (laughs) Bye-bye.